Hello and welcome. My name is Gabrielle Steinberg and today we are here on Boise State University Television Productions Hotspot. We have with us four students and employees who work here on Boise State's campus to talk about the, ha the parking policies that, are, that we have here. Um, we have on my left hand side people who are against the parking policies and who disagree and on my right hand side people who are for the policies. Let's go ahead and introduce them and figure out who we're going to be speaking with today. Hi, my name is BC Robbins. I'm a student here at BSU uh, and over the past few years uh, I've had some negative uh, situations and occurrences and events take place regarding the policies for parking here on campus. Uh, and We'll get into that later. My name is John Wynn. I'm a senior at Boise State. Uh, I'm a media production emphasis, and uh, I'm a commuter myself, and I'll be talking a little bit about why I think it's important to change the policies here at Boise State to benefit commuters. My name is Dane Johns, and I'm the Boise State University Student Assembly Assembly Person for the History Department, as well as the Caucus Chair for the Social Sciences and Public Affairs uh, College, and I have um, uh, two undergraduate degrees currently, and I'm seeking to go into grad school here at Boise State University. My name is Fred Swanstrom. I'm a sophomore here at Boise State University, and uh, I'm here to talk about why I think the parking policies are really great the way they are. So, BC, I know that you said earlier you have some negative, um, you have a negative story and some bad things that have happened here on campus with the policies. Do you want to talk about that a little, a little bit? Sure, yeah. Um, one of the situations I've, I've come across uh, more than once these last two years um, <clears throat> are that when I pay more than $100 for a parking permit, uh, I personally expect that that should mean that I am guaranteed a parking spot. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that's not how it often works out. I can think of three separate occasions over the last two years that I've come to campus uh, on time to get to class, but instead of being able to go to the garage and find a parking spot, uh, it's instead been rented out for an event of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I realize that in certain situations, there's, there's no way around that, and that's why we have the huge football parking lot. Um, but I've paid a lot of money for a spot in a garage, and when those are then given out to people who are not students and who do not have a time crunch to be to class on time, <clears throat> it makes it very difficult. So I've been marked absent to class multiple times for being late because my parking spot was taken. Right. Do you guys kind of have anything to say about that? Do you, do you understand that? Do you kind of have a solution or, or a, a way to prevent that maybe? The garages, I, I can't speak to the garages, but I know that most of the lots on campus are oversold by 25%, assuming that not all students will be on campus at the same time. Um, events are really what, what it sounds like BC is talking about, and that's, that's really a separate issue as opposed to like how many uh, spaces are sold for any one time. So the, the event parking um, you know, really needs to be uh, kind of renovated and, and maybe updated a little bit, but uh, events bring way more money to this campus than the, the parking, then we would lose by maybe displacing one or two students for, to the other side of campus to park. And that revenue actually goes to help keep your tuition and stuff low. So you're really gonna get hit one way or the other, either paying a little more for a guaranteed spot, say in a reserved lot, or you're gonna end up paying it on the tuition side. Okay, and you just brought up reserved lots. What do you guys think about reserved lots? Would you, would you like reserved lots? Honestly, I, I think it's more than a black and white issue here. I think you can't say that it, it is or isn't a good or bad policy. I think there's a lot of things here that we need to talk about individually. Um, I know we've already gone really quickly from park, parking garages to reserve spots. Um, there's even you know street parking and metered parking and street metered parking. And the fact that the university is in essentially public land, and yet we're charging people to park on the streets. Um, there's a lot of different areas here that I think we can address individually. But as a whole, it's hard to say one way or the other it's good or bad. While I'm here against the policies, I, I, I'm here saying that I disagree with the majority of the policies right. um, in those small instances that I spoke about. Do you have one policy that you'd like to speak on? Uh, one, one that I think is fairly important is like the park across the, across the river. Um, the park is an area that, in my opinion, should be open access to anybody to park at. However, there are signs up in the park that say no parking between the months of September to May. 
Everybody knows what September to May is, that's school season. So why is the city and the university supporting that decision to basically lock parking down for students who could easily walk across a bridge to attend school? Well, the reason's simple. They'd rather charge somebody for a parking spot on campus than allow them to park for free in the park. Okay. I think that an answer to that goes beyond um, the realms of transportation and parking services. I think putting the burden on transportation for that issue is um, unfair because there is a two-way street between Boise City and transportation in that situation. So I don't really see how those two things um, are trans or that is transportation's fault, um, especially when we look at uh, transportation's like parking rates compared to like Boise rates. Um, for example. For a reserved permit to park in any garage in uh, various lots on campus, you pay $320 for a full year. Whereas if we look to garages um, across Boise, um, Boise Plaza Car Park, for example, is $100 a month to park in their garage. And uh, Oahe Plaza is, um, is uh, s around $100 a month as well. Those are private garages, though. You're not talking about a public parking area. It's not a public garage. It's not a public institution. So they have the right as a corporation to charge whatever they want for parking. And the, so going back to, you know, stay, stay on the park here for a minute. Sure. The, it's not Boise State University that has anything to do with studying that policy. And the signs actually say two hour parking limit, September to May or before five o'clock. And so you can park there if you're coming to one class and going back that you won't get towed, you won't get a ticket, I've done it myself. Mm -hmm. That's actually Boise Park and Rec that has set that. It's the city that doesn't want um, the tennis courts and the park itself and the zoo clogged up by students trying to avoid paying for parking fees on campus. The Boise State actually has nothing to do with that. And, and after talking to Nicole, who's the director of parking uh, services, she has absolutely no influence in how Boise City sets their parking, their parking rules. Okay. Do you guys have any other comments on the, on the park side of it? Or any other feedback? Not do you guys, for the park, no. Not for the park. Do you guys have any points you'd like to bring up about kind of why? Um, yeah, my big support comes from um, the pricing that Boise State provides, which is extremely okay. cheap. Um, as I mentioned, uh, in comparison to similar um, spaces around Boise, um, because a lot in downtown is very similar infrastructure and location-wise to a lot on Boise State's campus. Um, so I think that the prices that Boise State provides to benefit their students is actually extremely uh, generous and beneficial to the students when they could be charging more than uh, the precedent and standard that has been set by Boise City. Right, and so you're bringing up pricing a lot. What, what would you guys like to see in pricing? What do you? I think pricing is difficult because honestly to me it seems like an arbitrary number, which it's hard to argue one way or the other with a price. I mean, if you're gonna set a standard at $100 a month, who's to say 80 isn't more fair or 120 is gouging? I mean, it's, it is an arbitrary number, and I think you guys could probably agree with that, at least for the parking lots. With the garages, I think it's a little more understandable where you have to maintain the cost to maintain the facility. You know, there's you know, electricity that they're paying for and the actual construction cost. I get that, but the problem that I have is with open lots where they're charging an arbitrary number, and I think that number could easily come down, as well as the parking meters which are 30% more expensive on campus than they are in the city. So speaking to the, to the flat lot pricing, the flat lots have to be resurfaced, repainted, and fixed every summer. Uh, if you've been on campus during the summer, that's a huge project. The parking lot prices um, are set based on use and how much it costs to resurface the size of the lot. So it's not really an arbitrary number. I mean, parking is making some profit, and um, I have a point on why they're making profit later on, but they've actually uh, changed some of their policies so that they're making less of a profit to benefit students, but those, those prices aren't an uh, arbitrary number. They're based on how much time, effort, and energy, and, and cost in the summer it takes to resurface, repaint, renumber, and redistribute all those prices, plus there's the the parking pass itself, which has a small cost. You mentioned uh, some changes recently. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I the only changes I know of that have happened in the last couple of years for um, the uh, transportation department for BSU is that they changed the price of the uh, <clears throat> handicap parking spots, uh, which were initially more expensive than a general lot and now are considerably less expensive. Right, so that's one of the changes. They've also added additional motorcycle spots, encouraging people to conserve uh, fuel and ride motorcycles to campus. There are three new areas where you can park that five years ago didn't exist. Uh, they've also, um, again, they've changed the size of some lots to bring some of those uh, charges 
uh, more into a more manageable area uh, so that you're not paying you know, $400 for a general lot because that lot is so big and it costs so much money to, to resurface that. They've changed the sizes and locations. Uh, they've also changed a few of their policies around game days in when and how they shut down lots. Uh, two or three years ago, it used to be if there was a game, you couldn't park there at all, um, aside from football, which is that's still the, the policy. But now for basketball, instead of closing down the lot the day of and forcing residence hall students to move their cars, they don't close that lot down until 5 o'clock or a few hours before the game. And if you got there uh, to go to school, you can stay in that lot up until about two hours before the game. So they've made it a little more convenient, again, with some of those events for students, and they've altered the shapes of lots. One of the new ideas um, that's been bannered around the parking office to, in addition to this is um, opening up the East Stadium lot, the one that gets used very rarely, the one that's next to Broadway, and sectioning that off into another parking area of general and actually lowering the price of that cost if students are willing to walk all the way across campus. That's one of the few lots that rarely gets filled up. It's I'll rarely full. I have a, I have a question. Um, I know that there was the stadium put in by the indoor stadium. What do you guys think about that parking? Because it, it took up all of those parking spaces to put the indoor stadium on the uh, parking lot. What do you guys think Are about you that? About the Taco Bell Arena? No, not the top, the indoor, the, addition, the, addition the Kevin the... Williams, yes. They just put that in and that took up, you know, many parking spots. Um, what do you guys think about that? You brought up the parking with... The East Stadium. So um, that actually took up a mostly residence hall Passes. I was a residence hall student here when that Kevin Williams was being built. Uh, it affected mostly students living in Chafee Hall, and I believe that they have opened up additional, so they've extended residence hall parking around the corner up into in front of the stadium now to alleviate some of that. Um, Boise State University, along with all uh, secondary education institutions have a habit of putting athletics first and academics second, and that's a sore spot for those of us who don't play or don't benefit from the scholarships related to those, but that's just another example of making room for, um, for athletics where, and, and kind of pushing academics and, and regular students to, to the side. To jump on the comment that you made about expansion and stuff and how they've done a lot in the last few years, don't you think that attributes though to the population increase of the campus, that it might not actually be a plus, but they're meeting the standard? So if they had, say, 10,000 students this year and 5,000 lots, and you see an expansion of 2,000 uh, parking spots, and you're like, oh, great, well, we also gained 5,000 more students. So really, it's not, a, it's not a benefit or a change. They're just trying to keep up with the demand. They're actually not able to keep up with the demand. Um, the, at the rate, especially during the Kellen Moore years, our numbers grew exponentially every year to the point where Boise State was maybe overbalanced with student populations and especially commuter populations. Um, the introduction of CWI has lessened our commuter uh, student population significantly because Nampa and Caldwell students are staying in Nampa and Caldwell to go to CWI for the first part of their school. So that actually lessened some of the parking burden for us. Uh, but part of, and so I, I said I would speak as to why they're earning a profit. Boise State is to the point where it can really no longer expand horizontally. Um, we're out of places to build parking lots, we're out of places to build buildings, so everything's gonna get taller. And so part of the reason why parking and transportation with their strategic plan is making a profit is so that they can build more garages. I think there's a plan for at least two more parking garages to try to accommodate some of the demand for students. And, and eventually, if you've looked at the 20 year plan, uh, University Drive goes completely away. It'll be a walking lane only. All those, everything up to, to Beacon, everything to Broadway, everything even past Capitol, and then we've hit the river on the other side. So we're really gonna have to become a vertical campus and we can't do that without funds. Well, and I saw on a, on a plan previously earlier this year that where the new rec facility was built, the new outdoor field, that there was land over there that the university wanted to purchase. However, they didn't want to purchase it because the tax value of that property would have been too expensive to make it a parking lot and to me that's just saying that's it's all about profit and loss and if you're willing to take a profit somewhere then you should be able to take a loss somewhere else so if you're gaining revenue and part of the parking system you should be able to eat the cost to be able to expand it out as opposed to we only want to make a building here if we can make profit off of it right and, and there's oh, I want to just I have a question about um you guys are talking about profit and you know incoming money and BC what do you think about the tuition um, including a parking permit and kind of if you're an out-of-state student or an in-state student it's included because you're already paying that high tuition um, kind of putting me on the spot here do you, do you have a stance on that um I don't know I, I was part-time for for so long that I honestly I didn't pay attention to it um, and this year I, I am full-time uh, but I still had to pay quite a bit of money for my parking 
So I guess I would say that I'm not aware that uh, it is included in tuition because I had to pay no, no, quite no. a if, bit for if it. If it were to be included, oh. would you like that? Would you think that was... Well, we'd still have to have the same cost. I mean, it would be part of tuition, but and it, it might even be more cost because once you change something, it becomes more. Um, but I would say that guaranteeing a spot Seeing, saying in writing somewhere when you buy a, a parking ticket or if it's included in tuition of some kind, saying when you come to campus, you will have a spot. Say mm -hmm. that your lot is full, say that there's not a single spot in your lot. I would like it if you could say, okay, well, there's a lot right there. I don't have the right sticker for it. If I write a note for the guys, I hope that they'll let me you know, not ticket me, but right. I've done that before and I still get ticketed. Right, and Fred, what do you think about what do you think about that? Um, I think something important to note is that something transportation parking already does is they include the Valley Ride bus system free. Um, so all you have to do is get that bus sticker and that is paid, paid for um, by transportation parking like it's taken care of by them. So that's something they already do provide. Um, and I do have some comments on the uh, idea of limited, like how we have a limited number of spaces and it seems we're losing more. Um, I think it's also important to look uh, at Boise State in comparison to like, uh, their sister universities that are nearby. And I actually have a little bit of information on that. Um, the number of parking spaces at uh, Boise State University as of fiscal year 2012 were 7,700. Um, Portland State has 4,000 and Georgia State has 5,000. But if we look at the student populations, uh, Georgia State, while only having 5,000 spots, has 31,000 students. And Boise State has 7,700 spots and they have 22,000, uh, around 22,000 students. So in comparison to other universities, Boise State really does um, provide a lot, a lot of space of, for mm -hmm. their students. Portland State, though, is also inner city, whereas Boise State is definitely separated from the city. So they're, they're, the numbers can show a great positive message, but when you look at the actual location of where the university is, you're looking at a different picture. Portland State is right in the heart of Portland. And it, and it would make it really difficult for Portland State to be able to control that parking in the city, whereas Boise State has much more of an ability to, exp not to say expand out, because I know you already mentioned that we're pretty much maxed out, but we're not in the heart of the city. We, we're kind of, you know, on the other side of the river separated, where we, I think we have the ability to change a little bit more than, say, an inner city college. Okay. I think it's also important to note that um, as far as Boise State, where the location is at, it's still relatively in the city. Um, and also, it's important to note that uh, while those may be in inner city areas, like the issue isn't necessarily with like the location, but it's about the number of students per spot. So it doesn't necessarily matter where it's located. It's about Boise State has more spots for a lot, uh, a lot more spots um, for a larger number of students in comparison. Yeah, I think it does matter if it's within, you know, location of the city like Portland State, because at least in Portland, you, the students have the option whether or not they want to park and pay for university parking or if they want to pay and park for city parking. Whereas here, we really don't have that option because we can't go to the park. We can't park beyond the limits of the parking garage or the parking lots because that's all controlled by the university as well. You can, you can drive 10, 20 blocks outside of the center of the university and you still can't park on the street because there's the sign that says general permit required. And I really, like if you guys could answer that or like maybe have an argument for that, I'd love to hear it because I don't know why I can't park on the street. Uh, right. Yeah, I'd like to add to that, that places like Portland and I believe Georgia State as well um, have a different type of transportation system in their cities. Uh, mm -hmm. Portland State, you can literally take the tram, the subway, or sorry, yeah, uh, the, the max. max, thank you, right to campus. From and those go every five minutes. Where and I know we're talking a different system. You know, we're talking the Valley Ride system, which is separated. But the university has a lot of pull with that. There's a reason why things happen. You know, between the university and the city, because President Custra can go speak to Mayor Beater and they can get things done. I think that's a really valid point. That if we don't have a bus system here, how can you use that as, a, as an excuse or an argument to say we have this available? Unfortunately, also I, I tend to stay on campus quite a bit after 6 p.m. because I'm I'm doing school-related activities. I'm either working on film or uh, working in a club, and because of Valley Ride's decision to not run after 6 p.m., that makes it so that I have to drive to campus because I can't I can't bike home in the dark and the weather's awful. I mean, we live in Idaho. There are, there are days out of the year where you cannot bike or walk to school. I, I think also, though, in the realms, we have to remember that we're talking about Boise State transportation and not Boise City sure. versus um, Portland City. And when we look at how a Boise State is uh, like allowing this or is having this busing system is, in a way, sponsoring it, transportation parking, um, 
if that has nothing to do with the city. That's all done by parking, and that's all for the benefit of the students so they can commute. You have something to say? Yeah, yeah. so um, I can answer your question about why you can't park on the street. The general permit required, if you'll notice in the bottom right-hand corner of that sign, there's an R. That's a city residential permit. They're not all residential areas, though. I mean, especially up on the on the Broadway side of, of that, that's like non-residential, just general permit. Whereas, as opposed to, I know we were talking about by Juanita. Right. Yeah. In that area, that, like I know there's two streets. It's Juanita and the one that runs so uh, Boise, perpendicular to that. So Boise State owns two, uh, they have purchased two of the roads, and I think it's Manitoba, Manitou, uh, Manitou and there's another one. Mm -hmm. So Boise State owns all the buildings on them, and they've actually bought the road from the city, and has turned that into like additional parking. The 20-year plan, like I said, University uh, Drive will no longer be a drivable road, it'll be a walkway, and Boise State will expand all the way out to Beacon. So it's in purchase, like, and, and because of that, the city no longer maintains those roads either. Those are Boise State University property. Um, and I can't remember what the other road is, but I know Manitou is one of them. And does it goes up to does Beacon. Does that include university? Um, not yet. No, you can okay. still park on the, the no, street I'm saying, in university. Do you, know the, do you know if the school owns university? Not drive? yet. Okay. That's, it's in the 20-year plan. Okay. They'll, they'll purchase university and shut that, the driveway down. But you can still park on the street in, for, uh, at university all the way up to where the link. And then you can park on Lincoln around the corner. So there's sections you can mm -hmm. and there's sections you can't. But the ones you can are owned by Boise State. So you guys talked a little bit about um, the bus system and incorporating that. Kind of going off of that, what do you think about making it a more bike-friendly place um, to maybe prevent all of these cars on campus and make it more um, accessible for bikers? I'm a cyclist and I'm all for it. However, I think the university has failed in promoting that. Um, you see things like the bike lanes that were installed on campus and it was just a complete failure. The right. only people I ever see on the bike lanes are pedestrians. Nobody right. seems to know what they're for and they completely bypass the quad. You know, if you really want to make traffic go from the sub to the ILC, you put a bike lane through the middle of the quad. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, that would be the best, easiest way to get students from one way to the other, not reroute people all the way around the green belt. People know the green belt's there, the, the path is already there. All they have to do is walk their bike down a sidewalk and hit it. But instead, the university wasted money that could have gone to another program or to an actual usable system, like a path through the middle of the university. And I, honestly, as a cyclist, when you see all the bike racks just get ripped out of the quad and thrown behind the buildings, it makes it really frustrating to want to ride your bike to, to school because you realize that, yeah, sure, I'm riding a bike, but a bicycle should be able to park as close to the building as I can get, exactly. not tearing them out just to beautify the, the campus and throw all these right. smaller, uh, low-capacity bike racks on the outer, outer ring of the university. Okay. So, what do you... Um, to say? I'd like to speak to the bike racks coming out of the quad. That was actually a security, not transportation call. Uh, there were two students two years ago that were like broken bones injured by cyclists ripping through the quad. And I believe one student even went to the hospital because of a concussion because he in that wreck he fell off of his bike. So that's why all the signs went up that they're a pedestrian friendly zone like don't bike through the quad. All the buildings have rear entrances next to the bike racks so you can always pike your park your uh, bike and come in the back with the exception of the library. It's the only one without a rear entrance. Um, and so uh, parking and transportation has also added uh, security cameras uh, over the new bike racks they've installed near the ILC and they have I believe an indoor bike station inside the parking garage on Lincoln and they have plans to expand those. Um, one of the things parking and transportation is really concerned about is increasing bike traffic so you're going to see those changes come down the pipe in the next two or three years. may not affect you right now but you know those things are coming. I just think when the answer is so simple though when the answer is just fix it this way and they go about it a totally different way it, it's really bothersome as a cyclist to see the more difficult route taken <clears throat> instead of the simple, the simple route. Well, I mean, one thing they could have done is just put, an, I mean, there's spots for it in all of the grass. You could put a, a three to five foot wide track that just says cyclists have priority here. Mm -hmm. Just, just, like, have that just right like they already the did, they just put it in an odd location. And yeah. I mean, when you look at it, you, everyone, I think everyone's confused why there's this random path beside a sidewalk that's not clearly labeled and there's all these little <laughs> intersecting concrete lines in between them. And, I think just becomes that a mess. what that is? They're supposed to be bike lanes. Like, okay. All right. mm -hmm. I'm a pedestrian and I didn't have any problem reading that they were for cyclists, but cyclists who come through the quad quickly, I'm sure miss them, um, which is, a, as a pedestrian through campus, frustrating to still have all those bikes in the center. So I'm sure there's frustrations on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a cyclist only path through the center of the uh, campus would have been more effective, but I think this is a way to kind of increase safety as well as provide a place where cyclists can get quickly to and from. I mean, cyclists have, are already moving faster than pedestrians, so having them go a little bit out of their way I don't think is unreasonable, but you know, there's probably a better place to put that. Yeah, and I also think it's important to understand like, that a lot of the burden of, of this is on the cyclist 
and that there's an issue um, with cyclists who use the sidewalks and can ram into people, as has been mentioned. So it's um, a lot on the cyclists that if, they're use, if they see these thing, resources available, they can use those. And um, also I think it's important to mention that Boise State has actually, um, is, or tr Boise State Transportation is looking into um, those like pay-as-you-go bikes as well. Mm -hmm. So that's something to look forward to in the future as well. Which if they do it, it's too. great, but you look at the zip car and that kind of failed on campus. We had yeah. the zip car and there was only four cars on campus and that lasted two years and they started pulling them. It just, it, it seems like the university just didn't put it out there enough or advertise it. I don't know if people didn't want to use them. I honestly don't have the answer for why it failed. I just know it was a system that was put in place and it failed. So I would like to see the bike succeed, but again, it's- Do you know a little if, bit about the zip cars? I, I don't, I don't have any answer for you as to why they failed. I know there are still two zip cars on campus that are over by right. the sub. So, I mean, it's not that's completely all that's failed. They went from four to two. Right, and the other two were over by the Morrison Center yep. in the apartments. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure why they failed, but I know they're still available for students mm -hmm. who don't have their own cars. Uh, I'm gonna guess probably prohibitive cost. I mean, if you're a dorm student and you're not working, right. you already don't have a lot right. of money to pay to rent a car to go to Walmart or something like that is, is a prohibitive cost where you could just walk through the park and go to Winco. So do you guys have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave this with for um, the disagreement side? <clears throat> if you want to field this, you can. I think that if the university and the parking system is going to try to encourage people to take alternative means of transportation, the alternative means of transportation has to be there. And I know we kind of talked about it a little bit, but I, I think by having the shuttle, the university shuttle, which shuttles a little bit around campus, it's just not advertised well enough. There's not clearly enough marked spots saying this is a shuttle that can take you to the other side of campus. With it not running enough, uh, the valley ride system not being there enough. You know, I live in Southeast, which is a three mile commute on my bike, which in the summertime or the spring, that's fine. But in the wintertime, I need to be able to take a bus. So that, only, that bus only runs once an hour. There needs to be more frequent running buses. And the university has pull. You know, they can be meeting with the city and with valley ride and trying to get more, uh, more buses running on the schedule that support Boise State. Um, yeah. BC, do you have anything to add? Uh, I, I think that there are changes that need to be made. And I think that um, while I, I respect that uh, the transportation department is, feels that they're doing what they can and as much as they can and they have plans to make things better, um, I just feel like we as the, the general populace of BSU don't see it happening. Right. And uh, we'd like to. And you guys, do you have any last? We have um, yeah, I, I just think that, I, I still think that uh, the policies offered are really good for a lot of reasons. All the services that Boise State offers between mm -hmm. their biking, their bus transportation, and um, also uh, when you look at a comparison to other schools, they do really well. And it always seems that transportation parking is looking to make things better. So while like the current situation um, is often perceived as bad, um, transportation is always moving forward to better right. those issues that people have. Right, and Dane? I think uh, like with any campus that experiences growing pains or any institution that experiences growing pains, troubles are gonna come down the pipe. And parking and transportation have been really proactive the last five years. Uh, they've increased the number of uh, ticket waivers that they've given by 25% to students who have the same problem that BC is like, I can't find right. a class and I have a ticket. If you go into the office and talk to them, there's a good chance you'll get that ticket waived. Right. Um, there's, they've, they've you know, increased the number of garages. They've kind of uh, altered how they're going to do their, their passes. I really feel like with a, with a growing institution and a slow moving bureaucracy, they're really doing the best they can and they really have students' best interests at heart. Very nice. And that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much for joining. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, like us. Give us any comments or feedback that you have and we'll see you next time on BSU UTP Hotspot. <laughs>